I'm here to talk to you about resilience today in a while, but for me, we can't even begin to talk about resilience without first talking about trauma. People used to tell me that I was really resilient, and if you'd asked me what that word meant, I would have said, well, it means strong. It means that somebody's really strong. But actually, the word resilience means absolutely nothing unless the person that you're ascribing it to, firstly, understands what it means in the context of them and their self. And secondly, that they know how to use that resilience. Now, I want to introduce you to someone and something that we use at the Resilience Learning Partnership to help people better understand resilience and how it actually works. And I said we can talk about, about resilience without first talking about trauma. And so I want to introduce you to Shannon. Shannon's a case study that we use at RLP to help people explore resilience. And I just want to give you a little bit of an insight into her life. Both Shannon's primary caregivers are alcoholics. She lived in various women's aid refuges throughout her early childhood. She witnessed an extreme amount of violence as a child and young person and was taken into care aged 12. She left school at 14 with no formal qualifications and she has multiple convictions. She experiences homelessness as a child, a teenager and as an adult and has a teenage pregnancy. Her first serious relationship is domestically violent. And I think one thing we can all agree today in this room is that Shannon's had a pretty traumatic life. And who in this room would think, having lived that life, Shannon would be really resilient? Show her hands of people who would think that she's quite a resilient person. Well, actually, how would you feel if I said you were wrong in thinking that Shannon, as she is now, is resilient? And I would even go as, as far to suggest that Sharon doesn't even really know what the word resilience means, particularly in the context of her. No way. The reason I can stand here today and say that with such certainty and such conviction is because, well, I'm Shannon. That case study we just looked at, those bullet points that I read through to you, those were my experiences of life those were my traumas. And so how do we get from that case study, from those bullet points, from Shannon surviving bullet point to bullet point? And I say that word very specifically, surviving, because that's what Shannon was doing. She was surviving life, event after event, traumatic time after traumatic time, she's surviving. I was surviving. That's what I've done. I lived my life in survival mode for an awful long time. And so how do we get from that place that I like to call survival mode to even the beginnings and the realms of what I now call resilience mode? Well, eight years ago, I began a journey. A journey of healing. A I went to university, age 29, and extremely wary of the world and the people in it. And for the first time in my life, I experienced choice, real choice. Not choice made in survival mode, or choices made when you don't really have another choice, but you've got to make a choice to do something, which isn't really a choice, is it? But real choices, my choices, informed and educated, trusted choices, for the first time ever in my adult life, I was continuously and consistently welcomed and encouraged to collaborate not only in my educational experience at university, but with my peers, with the lecturers and tutors who taught me, and with the university itself ultimately in the end through different pieces of research and work that I took part in. I was empowered every single day that I spent there by the phenomenal individuals who I had the privilege of being taught by and again, by my peers, by people who became my colleagues, and actually by the institution itself. As I pursued a career in teaching, I came up against a lot of challenges. If we remember back to Shannon's slide and those criminal convictions, I just couldn't get away from them, especially in pursuing a, a career in teaching. 
and the university and its policies and procedures empowered me and helped me understand why those were a barrier and helped me overcome them. Those same individuals who empowered me and who offered me opportunities to collaborate and ultimately lots of choice, those same amazing individuals helped me learn to trust again. And not only trust the world, but the people in it. And actually, authority. For the first time in my life, I began to trust an authoritative institution, which was my university. I had a particular distrust of teachers growing up because of my time in care, particularly in residential school care. And these amazing individuals at my university instilled trust back into me, actually for the first time ever. And all of these things that I've just told you about, my experience of choice, my experience of collaboration, of becoming empowered and of learning to trust again, I've done all of those things fundamentally whilst always being safe. Safe in my studies, safe in relationships, safe physically. These five principles are what we call the five principles of trauma-informed care. And although it was never labelled as such or framed as such to me at the time, it's exactly what I experienced and fundamentally it's what allowed me to discover and then understand and then build on and then use and ultimately own my own resilience. I told you we would get to resilience eventually. We explain the word resilience usually to young disadvantaged kids at disadvantaged and impoverished schools up and down the country. And we see all those poor kids, those poor, be disadvantaged kids. <coughs> they're so resilient, they're so strong. And to be honest, they're usually only saying that because they're still alive, they're still breathing. And I can tell you from someone who lived their life in survival mode for most of my 30 years, that doesn't feel good living in survival mode. And it doesn't feel what it feels like when you go into resilience mode. Yet up and down the same country, in very different schools and in camps that usually only rich people can afford to send their kids to in the summer, we teach those exact same qualities that we find valuable and insightful in someone who displays great resilience, but we frame it as leadership. Why do we do that? You know, why do we do that? As someone who is told very regularly, you're very resilient, Shumila, you display great resilience. To someone who is now also told almost on a daily basis, you're a leader now. And what you do, your role at the Resilience Learning Partnership and the work these guys do, you're a leader. Do you see how those two things add up? How one makes a great other, yet we, we frame them very differently as we assign them to different sections of society. Resilience is a very, very special quality in people and not everybody has it, actually. Many people who do have it don't know that they have it. They don't even know what it means or how to tap into it and use it to overcome their challenges. And at the Resilience Learning Partnership, we get to do this on a daily basis. We work with people who have lived experience of trauma and we help them discover how they're resilient, what that resilience means for them, what it can do for them. And we get the added bonus of feeding that directly into the learning and development of staff across the sectors of health, criminal justice, social work and education. And it's this new way of doing things, of tapping in to an intact resource, which is the resilience in people who have come through the systems and the procedures that we have often created to contain them and to keep them safe. By tapping into that, we can learn so, so much within the sector. And ultimately, I believe that this way of learning and developing for our staff, within our schools, within criminal justice, within social work, this is the future, this is a new way of doing things. And I think when we begin to realise that and truly, truly understand it and value it for what it is and give it the recognition that it deserves, only then, will we even begin to understand the true power of resilience. Thank you so much for listening.